Today, we're going to explore the latest updates and changes in the Kubernetes platform, specifically in the newly released 1.29 version. As always, this update has new features, API changes, improved documentation, cleanups, and deprecations. My name is Mumshad Manamad, and welcome to CodeCloud. A quick note to subscribe to our channel to receive latest updates on Kubernetes as and when they release. The theme for the 1.29 release is Mandala, the universe. This new version takes its cue from the exquisite Mandala art, a representation of universal perfection, embracing the transformative essence of Mandala. Kubernetes 1.29 works a new chapter in our project's journey. Every contributor, user, and supporter is like a shining star in the Kubernetes galaxy, guiding us forward. Collectively, we are crafting a realm of endless opportunities with each release adding to our shared universe. Now, this release is the third release of 2023 and includes 49 enhancements. 19 are new or improved alpha enhancements. 19 are beta enhancements enabled by default from this release. And 11 enhancements are stable now. As I've said before, Kubernetes has a multi-stage feature release process where each enhancement goes through the alpha, beta, GA, and stable phases. And if you're interested in learning more about how an enhancement request goes through Kubernetes, well, check out our video on Kubernetes enhancement proposals. Also note that we have a new version of the Kubernetes uh, 1.29 uh, release playground available for free on CodeCloud. So head over to this link and access the free playground that's available. You'll be able to check and try all of these features that we're gonna talk about in the rest of this video on this playground. And please remember to save it in your bookmarks so that you can easily access it in the future. Now we have selected 10 major enhancements of this release to go through in this video. The first in our list is about sidecar containers. Now, if you've seen our previous video on 1.28 uh, release, you've already familiar with the concept of sidecar containers in Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, containers within a pod share networking and storage, and typically a pod consists of the main container and optionally some helper containers, which perform auxiliary tasks such as logging or monitoring. And these are often termed as sidecar containers. Introduced in Kubernetes 1.28, the sidecar container pattern became a built-in feature, marking a significant step in supporting auxiliary container roles within a pod. Now, Kubernetes 1.29 formally enhances the sidecar container pattern with two key features. Sidecars now initiate before the main containers and, importantly, terminate only after all the main containers have exited. So this ensures uninterrupted support throughout the main container's lifecycle. Now, upon pod termination, sidecar containers shut down in the reverse order of their startup, so this serialized order is crucial for properly unwinding dependencies. What happens is each sidecar container will receive a SIG term after all the main car containers have been terminated. The next one on our list is in-place update of pod resources. Now in Kubernetes, dynamically changing the resources allocated to containers becomes essential in scenarios like handling a significant increase in load or where the current resources prove insufficient or when the load decreases considerably leaving allocated resources underutilized. And this need is also evident when resources have initially been set incorrectly. Now, traditionally, adjusting these resources meant recreating the pod since the container resources in pod spec were immutable. Now, this approach, however, posed challenges, especially for stateful or batch workloads where pod restarts could lead to lower availability or higher operational costs. There's a shift towards more fluid resource management. The update allows for the in-place adjustment of a pod CPU and memory allocations, addressing these challenges head on. With this enhancement to dynamically update pod resources in Kubernetes 1.29, you can follow these steps. So first, you update the resource requests or limits in your pod specification as you would normally edit a file. And for instance, if you want to change the memory limit, you would go in and change the memory limit on a pod specification file first. And then you use the kubectl apply command to apply or update the pod spec. And Kubernetes will then start the process of resizing the resources as specified. Now, why wasn't this possible before? Initially, Kubernetes pods had immutable pod specs for container resources. So any change required the pod to be recreated, which wasn't efficient for certain workloads. Now, dynamically managing resources involves complex monitoring and adjustments at runtime. So early versions of Kubernetes lacked the necessary mechanisms for this. The Container Runtime Interface, or CRI, had limitations, especially the Update Container Resources API, which was not fully equipped to handle dynamic resource updates across different types of containers and operating systems. And Kubernetes did not have detailed tracking and management mechanisms for in-flight resize operations and actual resource usage at the container level. Now, implementing mutable resources required overcoming operational challenges related to scheduling, resource allocation, and maintaining high availability, especially for stateful and batch workloads. So how was it made possible 
in earlier Kubernetes versions, once a pod was created, its resource allocation like the CPU and memory couldn't be changed without restarting it. Now, the pod specs are mutable, meaning you can adjust the resources of a running pod, like increasing the memory or CPU limits without needing to restart it. And this makes resource management much more flexible and responsive to changing demands. The next major is the enhanced pod status information. To support this new flexibility, Kubernetes includes additional fields in pod status. The first one is allocated resources. So this shows the amount of resources currently allocated to the pod, providing a snapshot of what the Kubernetes system has set aside for it. The next is resources. So this field reflects the actual resources the pod is currently using. The next is resize. This field tracks the status of any ongoing resource resizing operations, showing whether a request to change resources is in progress, completed, or facing any issues. For instance, you can check the pod.status.resize field to monitor the status of the resize operation. And this field indicates whether the resizing is proposed, in progress, deferred, or infeasible. Now, once the resizing is complete, verify the updated resource allocation by checking the allocated resources field under the pod.status.container statuses, and also by checking the resource fields under the pod.status.container fields. Another important mechanism introduced is container resize policy. So this policy allows more detailed control over how changes in resource allocation are applied to containers. For instance, you can specify whether a container can have its resources changed without needing a restart. And this is particularly useful for applications that have specific requirements for how resource changes are applied. The next one on our list is improving the reliability of ingress connectivity serviced by QProxy. Now, in Kubernetes, networking is a vital component orchestrated by several key elements working together. So QProxy is a network proxy that's running on each node, manages the routing of network traffic within the cluster. It ensures that the communication between services and external sources is accurately directed. Ingress controls how external traffic reaches the services inside the cluster, typically handling HTTP requests. And it's like the front door for your Kubernetes services to the outside Side world. Now, the Kubernetes Cloud Controller Manager, so KCCM, tailors the management of cloud-specific elements like nodes and load balancers, ensuring Kubernetes runs smoothly in cloud environments like GCP. Now, within this framework, there are two types of services based on their health checks, external traffic policy, so cluster, and the external traffic policy local. So the external traffic policy cluster, the default setting allows QProxy to respond based on its health, particularly regarding the freshness of data pipeline programming. In contrast, the local services report the readiness based on whether a service endpoint on the node is ready. So the new enhancement primarily focuses on the ETP cluster services. It focuses on refining QProxy's role, especially in connection draining, a process that's crucial when a node is terminating. And connection draining ensures that existing connections to a node are properly handled before the node actually shuts down, preventing abrupt disconnection and service disruption. And this feature improves how QProxy handles these scenarios, especially during scale downs. So it introduces a live Z health check path that's providing a more precise health status, crucial for load balancers in making traffic routing decisions. And these upgrades aim to bolster network reliability and efficiency in Kubernetes, particularly in cloud environments. Now, this has been graduated to beta now. The next one on our list is priority and fairness for API server requests. In Kubernetes, the API server handles various operational requests such as creating, reading, updating, or deleting resources. And we call them mutating requests and fetching data without alerting it, the read-only requests. So previously, to prevent overloads, which means excessive demand on the server, Kubernetes set maximum limits on these requests without distinguishing their importance. Now, this lack of distinction could lead to critical system functions like node heartbeats or kubelet and kube proxy operations, and even system self-maintenance tasks being overshadowed by less crucial requests. So a situation termed self-maintenance crowded out. Now, the priority and fairness for API server requests feature now stable in Kubernetes addresses these scenarios. It introduces a system where requests are categorized and prioritized, ensuring that essential system maintenance functions and requests critical to cluster health and uh, management are, aren't uh, neglected. And this mechanism not only safeguards against uh, server overloads, but also maintains fairness and optimizes throughput, ensuring a balanced and efficient handling of requests across various Kubernetes operations. This enhancement is particularly crucial in multi-tenant environments, ensuring fair resource allocation among different users and preventing issues like a single buggy tenant or uh, controller overwhelming the system. 
The next one on our list is uh, reducing secret-based service account tokens. Now in Kubernetes, service accounts are crucial for assigning identities to processes that are running in pods, ensuring that they can securely access the Kubernetes API. Now these accounts are authenticated using service account tokens, which traditionally have been stored as Kubernetes secrets. However, storing tokens as secrets can pose security risks due to their broader accessibility and potential misuse. So with the bound service uh, account token volume feature becoming GA in Kubernetes 1.22, there's a significant shift in how pods uh, service account tokens are managed. Instead of traditional secret-based storage, these tokens are now obtained via the token request API and stored as a projected volume. Now in Kubernetes, a projected volume is a type of volume that maps several existing volume sources into the same directory. It allows you to project secrets or config maps and service account tokens into a pod. And this means that instead of using separate mounts for each source, a single projected volume can contain data from multiple sources, all accessible in the same directory. Now this approach enhances security by providing a more controlled and restricted token management system and the token's lifecycle is directly linked to the pod offering improved security over the previous method. And with this beta enhancement, Kubernetes further strengthens its security framework by eliminating auto-generated secret based tokens and cleaning up unused tokens, ensuring a tighter, more secure environment for managing service account credentials. So the next one on our list is supporting paged list queries from the Kubernetes API. So in Kubernetes, dealing with large data sets, especially when retrieving them from the API server can be challenging due to memory and performance constraints. So the traditional approach of fetching entire resource lists in one go could significantly strain system resources. So with the support for paged list queries from the Kubernetes API feature now stable in Kubernetes 1.29, this process has been optimized. So this feature allows API consumers to retrieve large sets of data in pages responses. So by breaking down a large list request into multiple smaller page requests, it dramatically reduces the memory allocation impact of these operations. And this enhancement is a boon for system scalability, making handling extensive data sets more efficient and reliable. The next one on our list is read write once pod persistent volume access mode. So in Kubernetes, storage management is a critical aspect and particularly handled through persistent volumes and storage classes, which you probably are already aware of. So PVs are storage resources in the cluster and storage classes allow administrators to define different storage types like SSDs or slower disks and manage them efficiently. Now, managing storage for different workloads efficiently has often been challenging. So previously, Kubernetes lacked a way to restrict persistent volume access to a single pod in a single node. And this limitation could cause problems, especially for sensitive workloads. For example, if a workload with the rewrite once access scaled to more than one pod and these pods landed on the same node, they could simultaneously modify the storage device leading to conflicts. Now, this led users to work around the issue by scheduling only a single pod per node, which wasn't always resource efficient. Now, with the rewrite once pod access mode, uh, which is now stable, addresses this by ensuring a PV can only be exclusively accessed by only one pod on a single node and thus enhancing both the security and efficiency in scenarios where data integrity and isolation are crucial. So this new mode is significant step forward in Kubernetes storage uh, management capabilities, offering a more tailored solution for handling sensitive and uh, critical workloads. So the next one on our list is structured authorization configuration. In Kubernetes, the Kube API server uses command line flags like the authorization related flags to set up its authorization process. And this step defines who can access the Kubernetes API and what they can do. Now the flags configure the authorization chain. So a sequence of steps in the API server follows to decide if a request should be allowed or denied. Now, historically, this configuration limited flexibility, particularly in integrating multiple webhooks, external services that provide additional authorization decisions, Having multiple webhooks means some more complex rules and checks can be applied before allowing access to the Kubernetes API. Now, Kube API Server brings a transformative approach to defining its authorization chain. Now, previously, the setup was limited by command line flags, but now administrators can use a configuration file to specify a sequence of authorization checks, including multiple webhooks. For instance, a config file might define a primary webhook for initial authentication, followed by a secondary one for more specialized checks. This format offers more more control, allowing for both ordered authorization modes and pre-filtering based on resources or users to avoid unnecessary processing. By introducing this feature, Kubernetes enables more complex real-world authorization scenarios, fitting diverse security requirements. And this new flexibility ensures that the API server can handle a variety of authentication and authorization workflows more efficiently and securely. Now, alongside the structured authorization configuration, Kubernetes has also introduced the structured authentication config in its latest release. So OIDC 
your OpenID Connect is a simple identity layer on top of the OAuth 2.0 protocol. And in Kubernetes, it's used for authenticating users against the API server. So JWT or JSON Web Token is a compact URL safe means of representing claims between two parties, often used in the OIDC for securely transmitting information about authenticated users. Now in the latest Kubernetes release, the structured authentication config enhances how OIDC and JWT are configured. Instead of relying on complex flag-based setups, it introduces a more structured versioned configuration approach. So this enhancement supports advanced features like multiple client IDs, more intricate claim mappings, and the use of multiple OIDC providers, simplifying and strengthening Kubernetes authentication mechanisms. The next one on our list is transitioning from SPDY to WebSockets. So in Kubernetes, kubectl is the command line tool that allows users to interact with the cluster as you already know. Now commands like kubectl exec let users execute commands in a container and the kubectl attach allows them to interact with a running container. Now these commands rely on a connection between the kubectl client and the API server and the kubelet, which runs on each node, manages the containers. In Kubernetes, the bidirectional streaming refers to the continuous two-way communication between a client like kubectl and the Kubernetes clusters, that's the API server and the kubelet. And this enables real-time interaction with pods, such as executing commands in a container like kubectl exec command or attaching a running container like the kubectl attach command. Now, bidirectional streaming is beneficial as it allows for immediate and interactive communication. So that's crucial for tasks that require active monitoring or direct intervention in a container. Now, up until recently, Kubernetes used the SPDY protocol for this bidirectional communication. However, since SPDY uh, 3.1 has been deprecated uh, since 2015. Kubernetes has transitioned to using WebSocket. So this shift is critical for kubectl exec or kubectl attach and kubectl cp commands, which rely on a bidirectional streaming between the kubectl and the API server. And WebSockets ensure broader compatibility and future-proof these interactions. So the goals include not only to transitioning the protocol from for communication between kubectl and the API server, but also extending this to the communication from the API server to the kubelet. And this this extension means that the entire pathway from kubectl to the kubelet will leverage WebSockets, ensuring a more consistent and reliable streaming experience. In Kubernetes, an L7 proxy or gateway operates at the application layer of the network and is responsible for managing and directing traffic based on various factors like the URL, message content, etc., offering more sophisticated traffic routing capabilities than lower level proxies. Now, so with the switch to WebSockets for bidirectional communication in Kubernetes, users now have enhanced compatibility with these L7 proxies and gateways. So this means better integration and streamlined connectivity, especially in cloud environments or complex network setups like Google's Anthos Connect Gateway. So users running commands like the kubectl exec benefit from smoother, more reliable connections through these advanced networking components. The next one on our list is adding support for user namespaces in pods. So in Kubernetes, namespaces are a fundamental concept used for isolating groups of resources within a cluster. User namespaces, a specific kind of namespace, are focused on isolating user IDs and group IDs, enhancing security. So the major enhancement of adding support for user namespaces in pods means that Kubernetes can now isolate processes at the user level, and this allows a pod to run processes with different user and group IDs than those on the host. For example, a process that is privileged with a pod could run as an unprivileged user on the host. And this significantly mitigates security risks, especially if a process breaks out of a container. So this feature mitigates several past vulnerabilities. So the CVE 2019-5736 prevents overriding the host binary from a container. There's the CVE 2021-25741. So integrating user namespaces into Kubernetes pods introduces a key change in pod.spec. So a new field pod.spec.hostusers is now added. So when pod.spec.hostusers is set to true or not specified, the pod uses the host user namespace maintaining the current behavior. And if pod.spec.hostusers is set to false, Kubernetes creates a new user namespace specifically for that pod. And by default, this field isn't set, so implying that the pod will use the host uh, user namespace. And this addition provides users with the flexibility to enhance security by isolating pod level processes from the host. Well, that's all for this video. Thank you so much for watching and do make sure to subscribe to our channel to keep up to date with newer videos as and when they come out. And if you think this has been helpful for you, please do share it in your circle, in your friends and, and with your colleagues. And uh, also note that there is a Kubernetes 1.29 version of the playground that's available for free on CodeCloud. So go ahead and check the link out, save it as in your bookmarks so that you can easily access it in the future. And uh, thank you so much for watching again. And until next time, goodbye.